So welcome everyone. Um, my name is Rob Lu. I'm the faculty director of Harvard X, and my co-host is Samantha Earp, who's the executive director of Harvard X. And what we're hoping to do is to use this as an opportunity for us to brainstorm sort of around some ideas that involve Harvard X, but in particular, how Harvard X can continue to have an expanding and ever more positive impact on teaching and learning on campus. As we heard in the opening session, one of the foci that we have is how do we engage students? How do we, if you will, address the issues of distance, be it in terms of space, time, experience, backgrounds, etc., and aspiration? And as one might imagine, one of the pillars of Harvard X has always been to try and close the distance between Harvard, Harvard learning, and the entire world. But at the same time, another mission of Harvard X is to close the distance between the innovations that we create in online education and what happens on campus. To really erase that distance and to really use Harvard X as an opportunity to synergize, if you will, all the developments that we do online for use on campus, but also vice versa as well. So we have an opportunity to hear from two faculty members that have worked on Harvard X projects, and they will share with us sort of what that process was like, and also some of their thinking in terms of how, what they created, or the process of creation, and or, and, or the global audience connects with how they're thought about their teaching on campus. But before we get to that, what I'd love to do is to find out from this group sort of roughly where all of you are from in terms of your areas. Because from the, from the list that we got, there's remarkable sort of diversity in the room. And I think it would be great for the entire group to see that. So if you would categorize yourself in the arts and humanities, show of hands. OK. Social sciences. Okay. Natural sciences. Okay. Okay. So we do, and and also law, business, or medicine. Okay. <laughs> Not to lump all of those together, <laughs> but nevertheless. Okay. So we have a sense that we have quite a broad group, and one thing you should know is that we're going to have you working in groups. So at some point, if you want to rearrange so that you sort of fill out a table, we're going to have you work work together in groups. Because what we'd really like to do is to use this as a brainstorming session to hear from you, based on what you've heard about the Harvard X process, how you can think about sort of the transformative and potential of either one, two, or three things. I will just raise them now so you have this in your head, but we will also show it in a slide at the very end after Laurel and Trudy have shared with us but in particular, what we'd like you to brainstorm, and each group is going to make a poster expressing their ideas, so it will help you focus and coalesce your thinking, how can the content created in the context of a Harvard X project be transformative for your teaching? How can the process of reconceptualizing your course or the process of evaluating or doing research in the context of your course be transformative? And or, and or thirdly, how can access to the global audience be potentially transformative in terms of what you do with your students here on campus? So those three things, we will show them on screen at the end so that they'll be up for you. But as you hear, what Laurel and Trudy share, do have these notions floating in, the, in your head because we'd like you to work as a group to help us and, and each other think about what the possibilities are. Because Harvard X is a very grassroots kind of effort in that it's driven by faculty and what faculty want. And so what we're interested in hearing from you are some of your ideas in this regard as we move forward. So we're not going to show, I'm not going to talk a lot about Harvard X in general, because I think what's more important is for you to hear from faculty colleagues that have actually done things who will show us some pieces of what they've done and share what their experience has been. And then Samantha and I can fill in any, anything and respond to any questions that you might have before the group work begins. But so first, 
gives me great pleasure to introduce Laurel Ulrich. She is the 300th anniversary university professor. Um, she's also a preeminent historian. And I think she represents a remarkable way in which an online experience can bring you face to face with the reality of a tangible thing and history. So Laurel. Thank you. So I just want to capture before we begin the absolute paradox of working with tangible things and putting them in a virtual format. And that's the kind of tension that I've been working with in my Harvard X course. Um, I want, I cre uh, created with uh, my colleague Sarah Carter a, an online course that went up on the Harvard X platform in June. And uh, so it's still new. We've got some evaluation, some data that I will share with you in a few minutes. But I want to just uh, start by letting you see one of our modules. We did not sit in a studio and lecture. This is a course about engagement with tangible things, with statues, with baskets, with uh, books in the rare book library, with uh, clocks, with all kinds of things in a diversity of Harvard collections. So we made videos in the museums and libraries, and it was a lot of work, but a lot of fun. The very first video we made was outdoors, which was probably a great mistake. <laughs> but the uh, production crew managed to rescue it, at least in part. So I'm going to show you a little bit of that video to give you an idea of what it was we were trying to do. Our course is called Tangible Things, Making History Through Museum Objects, Artifacts, scientific specimens and the stuff around you. So we had, I think in our second week, um, a video that focused on a statue. So let's take a quick look at that. Here we are in the Harvard Yard, the most visited spot in Harvard University is probably right behind us here. It's the purported statue of John Harvard, the man who gave the college its name. Even tour guides refer to this statue as the statue of the three lies. It says on, right on the front of the statue, 1638. And of course, we all know Harvard's founded in 1636. The fellow sitting behind us is not actually John Harvard. The model for this statue was a Harvard graduate from 1882, Sherman Hoare. Good looking guy. We don't know that he had any resemblance whatsoever to John Harvard, who died in 1638. But he certainly looked like what someone thought a Harvard man should look like. The third and perhaps most shocking lie to people when they first hear it is that John Harvard is not actually the founder of Harvard. He was the first big donor to the college. Harvard College was really mostly an idea in 1636, although it was founded then. John Harvard gave this new college, showing his faith in it, his books. So why is it so meaningful that people keep touching John Harvard's toe. Why does it mean so much to visitors who come here? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> if John Harvard were to come back and walk around the yard, he would be horrified. <laughs> Stroking the toe of a statue to this early Puritan minister would seem like superstition. There was a big argument. Okay, um, we'll stop yeah. there. <laughs> and if you want to see this uh, video, you can go online and you can see this and all the others. So we set up a problem, a memory of something that happened 
being memorialized in the 19th century, something that happened in the 17th century. Thought that's a historical problem, evaluation of evidence, thinking about chronology. The other issue is the question about when did people start stroking this toe and why? Because it's such a contradiction to the period in which Harvard was founded, where any kind of um, veneration of a person uh, or a statue would have been considered, you know, popery for these early Puritans. The video ends, we go into Houghton Library, and we look at the one relic that actually survives from John Harvard, which is an amazing book, one of the many books he gave to Harvard College. And then through that book, we dig into some of the context in which Harvard was founded. So in uh, Tangible Things, um, we, um, as I said earlier, look at all kinds of documents. So we're not getting history of art, we're not getting history of medicine, certainly not history of science, although we draw upon experts in those areas and use some of that material. We're trying to argue that history is written through material objects, not just through written documents. And we're also trying to get museum people to think differently about their own collections. Collections are in silos in the world at large and very much at Harvard. So science doesn't very often talk to art. Uh, archival specialists don't very often talk to art historians and so on. So the course um, has a, a scale problem. <laughs> uh, I am a hands-on teacher. I have for 20 years worked around tables like this with small groups of students examining both documents and artifacts with or without white gloves. Uh, and the museums and libraries have been marvelously welcomed. So how does someone who believes in the tangible get mixed up with something <laughs> like Harvard X. <laughs> well, there's an evolution to this. Ivan Gaskell, former curator at the Prague Art Museum, and I were very excited about what we could do with small seminars. And over the course of about 10 years, we had students doing very intense, wonderful, case studies of particular artifacts in Harvard's museums. We taught maybe 75 students this method over that 10 years. And they were excited, and we wanted to see if we could scale it up to a general education course. We did that by mounting an exhibit. Some of you may have seen the exhibit, Tangible Things, in 2011 which we taught alongside with the general education course. Students had their assignments in the galleries, were looking at objects. They had to work with an object for a final project. It was labor intensive. We had to have 10 teaching fellows working with us. Um, it was a challenge, but it was very exhilarating. Sarah Carter and I taught it again. Actually, there's an error. We, error. we taught it last fall rather than in the spring. And about that time, we began to learn about the MOOCs and began to think, gosh, if we can deal with 200 students in a lecture hall, what can we do with thousands in a MOOC? <laughs> a silly idea. How are you going to connect these people with objects? Well, we did it. <laughs> and uh, that's how tangible things with our producer, Zach Davis, who was wonderful helped us to do this. So here's the idea. We would create a series of videos, case studies for how you work toward history from different kinds of artifacts. We would create videos in the collections as models. And then all of the assignments would require that the students go not to the internet. That was a rule to their desks, to their refrigerators, to the local park, to the local museum. 
and pick objects from their own environment and then apply our method to something that they had. And our idea was we'll get lots of great information back about how people are looking at <coughs> objects and what they what they think we're going to learn about the world because we knew that these online courses did that. So uh, what was the result? Well, we had uh, over 15,000 people initially registered for the courses. They represented 149 countries. I was fascinated with where they came from. Um, and I, I just this morning was looking in more, in more detail. 43% came from the US, which means, of course, <coughs> well more than half did not come from the US. Well, many of those came from English-speaking countries. Together, the United Kingdom, Canada, and Australia counted for 11%. That still leaves half who did not come from the expected places. A total of 5% of our students came from India. The one that blew me away, and I knew this was going to happen from reading student responses, 3% of our students came from Greece. We had students from Asia, from the South Pacific, quite a few, um, maybe a total of 7% from um, four Latin American countries, Argentina, Brazil, Colombia, and Mexico. And that was very exciting. Our numbers, I think, were pretty close to what generally happens. We had 7% uh, of those who registered completed the course. And Rob can tell you what that means. But that's a pretty good rate for an online course. And we were very pleased by that. So think about it. In one semester, Ivan and I would teach 10 to 15 students in a seminar. In one semester, Sarah and I taught 1,090 students. They're not going to get the same experience, obviously. But that's an incredible amount of outreach. And then the interesting thing is what we might learn as well, and how we might apply what we learned to our own students in our um, Harvard course, which I'm going to be teaching again this spring on campus. Now, the other thing that's fascinating is who, who these students are. And the students are almost all post-baccalaureate. Mm -hmm. This is adult education. And there were two kinds of students reading their evaluations. There were people who knew nothing about history and admitted it. Something like, I think, 34% knew very little or only a little. So they were there out of curiosity to broaden their understanding and to our joy, many said, I always thought history was boring. This was so fascinating. The others were pro actually professionals, working in museums or specialists in this area, who wanted ideas for their own museums or for their own teaching. And it was really interesting to see those two uh, groups. Uh, together. And I, my time is up, I think. Um, but I learned a lot from this course, and we're now on to the next adventure, which is to adapt our videos for use in our online course. But I just want to close with um, a statement from one of the persons who evaluated the course, which said, I hope that your Harvard students will have an opportunity to perhaps help develop some videos that you then can bring back to the online course. And we hope that that will happen. Because think of that. They would have a really interesting audience. Thank you, Laura. So I think we have time for a, for a couple of questions for Laura on her experience. What was the most challenging aspect of do, making that sh frame shift from tangible to um, uh, cyber? Um, 
Boy, the most challenging object is it is really hard to make a film. I've had some experience with that and I knew it. But the thing is you give up a lot of control. When you're in a classroom with students, I kind of control what we look at, how we see what's going to happen. And it, although it's true that cameras can do fabulous things, close-ups and angles and time-lapse and all of those great things, you're in the hands of the editor. And um, you know it's hard for us who want to be in charge. <laughs> So collaboration was the neatest thing about this course and the hardest thing. Yes? This morning, uh, somebody on the panel mentioned learning goals and having learning goals for every unit. So did your learning goals or what you were trying to accomplish have to change from how you prepare this course to <coughs> teach in a 10 to 15 student in-person seminar to uh, this large online MOOC, either because of the scale or because of the technology that you had to use to reach those students? Um, I think the fundamental goal was the same, and that is I'm passionate about reconnecting people to the material world around them. I, I'm just passionate <laughs> about that, and I know it happened because virtually all of the evaluations came back saying the same kinds of things that our students here come back saying, I had no idea. I will never look at an object the same way again. So that was fundamentally the same. In some ways, the online experience, um, however, it pushed us toward the, the ordinary and the accessible, although it wasn't ordinary to us because we were in all these other countries. But we couldn't take them into a physical space and control that space. And so, to make that work, we had to be very, very open about what people could work with. And I think our students actually would welcome that. I mean, we have them do projects on things in the museums, which is exciting, but we probably could do a lot more. He had a fabulous project on a thick ballpoint pen <laughs> where a guy found 80 areas of inquiry that he could do with his favorite big pen. And that was really fun. Thank you, Laurel. Okay. Hopefully we have time for more, more questions towards the end. But now we have Trudy Van Houten, a faculty member in the Department of Radiology at the Medical School, and will share with us Anatomy X. Good morning. Good morning. So one thing I learned when I was a scholar at the Harvard Macy Institute was a model for project design that they called the flying dog. And so what they said was that most design groups charged with designing a flying dog initially sit down and say, well, it's going to be difficult to design a flying dog. Dogs aren't really aerodynamically appropriate. Their shoulder girdle is wrong. There's a lot of reasons a dog can't fly. The other model for designing a flying dog is to say, <clears throat> oh yes, a flying dog is flying around right now, and we can see these features about it. That is why working with Harvard X has been one of the most positive, if not the most positive, experiences in my educational career. I came to them with a flying dog, and they said, oh yes, we can see that dog flying. <laughs> So our project hasn't launched yet. It's launching the end of this month. Um, <laughs> it will launch at the end of this month. Um, but we had something in common with Laurel's project, which was that we had an unusual resource that, for a variety of reasons, most people cannot see. And we wanted to make that available to a wider audience. So I'd like, first of all, to have you take our course, just very briefly and then maybe talk to you a little bit about how we designed it. So I think I should have had a disclosure slide first saying, mm -hmm. warning, there may be graphic anatomy, which is something we actually didn't think of in videotaping this stuff. So how to teach musculoskeletal anatomy to people with no biology background? Well, the first thing you need is bait. And so mm -hmm. we thought that common musculoskeletal injuries they may have had 
family members may have had, college roommates have played, played football, almost certainly had. So we wanted to start with five compelling cases. And we recruited various colleagues at the medical school to be the patients. And then we recruited uh, orthopedic surgeons from the Brigham and Women's Hospital to be the doctors. So that was the first thing. We wanted to engage them. We wanted to make them curious. We wanted to make them learn the vocabulary, the anatomy, the bones, joints, muscles, nerves, and vessels that they would have to know. So that is how we designed it. It's a series of five cases, which we hope will engage them and make them curious. Then a, and we'll show you some of those, then a set of didactic pieces, very interactive, with lots of low stakes uh, assessment questions. We learned that every seven minutes is about how often you have to give those, that they don't switch to Google for something else. <laughs> So we, we embedded that in it. And we also believe that the more they're affirmed in their learning, and the more often they're affirmed in their learning, the more engaged and happy to learn they're going to be. So that was the design. And after they complete that, the reward is we take them to the anatomy lab and replicate, actually, the surgical procedures in the anatomy lab. So this is something that we do in the anatomy labs anyway. And then the final part of the course is they have to commit to a diagnosis. And then we take them to the operating room with the surgeons um, as the last part of the case. So that's how we designed it. And um, there is graphic footage, so I should tell you that too. This is something, you know, there were so many unknowns in the frontiers of this project, like the camera crew going into the anatomy lab and experiencing the same thing that you may. So you will see actual cadaver dissections. Um, I was the project leader. Dr. Michael Parker <coughs> and Dr. Alex Bick actually appear in the videos. And most of all, I want to thank my wonderful Harvard Anatomy X team for all the wonderful support and, and things that they do. Anatomy is a very visual subject. It has been particularly hard to teach using older didactic methods. How can you teach the anatomy of the liver standing in front of students with um, a sheaf of, of paper notes and a, and a piece of chalk? And so one of the wonderful things this has done has helped me find better ways of teaching this very visual subject. So if we get the first video, it would be great. So you're all registered now. <laughs> of course. No. Uh, sorry, it's on the desktop? Oh. I think you all just learned my password. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Wanted to welcome you to Harvard Medical School. So we're doing a course which is Anatomy X, Musculoskeletal Anatomy. Initially it will consist of five clinical cases. So the online students will begin from the viewpoint of the orthopedic surgeon when the patients come to their first examination. Ms. Kimberly, I'm, I'm Dr. Delicio. Uh, nice to meet you. What happened? Uh, I was riding my bike to class this morning. She got hit by a car from behind. Okay. Well, let's take a look at it. Let me have you lie back down. And we're going to examine your knee here. I'm going to have you <clears throat> put your hands out like this. I'm going to test your sensation. Okay. So first of all, over here by the pinky finger where the ulnar nerve supplies, does that feel the same on both sides to you? Let's check your range of motion. That's important for us to assess your function. Okay. okay. I'm going to have you put your arms out in front of you and lift your hands up over your head as high as you can. And we want to provide them with some of the information that we give the Harvard Medical students here. So proximal means closer to the heart, and distal means farther away from the heart. In vertebrates, like ourselves, we have an endoskeleton, which means that the bones are not at the surface of the body, but the pattern in insects and crustaceans is to have an exoskeleton, which means that the bones will be on the outside. That was Here's an example of a plane. <laughs> there are two relatively flat surfaces. Gliding occurs when the articular surfaces of the bones meeting at the joint slide across one another with little or no angulation. So this is an example of gliding in a plane joint. The second type of phasic contraction 
is an isotonic contraction. So again, phas phasic because it's intermittent, isotonic because in this case, instead of maintaining a fixed length, the muscle actually shortens. So let's say you are working out in the gym, and that pathway begins in the central nervous system with an excitatory neuron, which synapses on a somatic motor neuron, skeletal muscle contracts, and let's imagine you're working out really hard, and in the next slide, you experience some <laughs> muscle discomfort, and muscle pain will be conveyed back in a somatic sensory neuron, reach uh, another sensory neuron in the central nervous system, and initiate an inhibitory response, which will stop somatic motor innervation, relax the muscle, and enable it to return to a more comfortable state. A lumen is defined as the central space enclosed by a tubular structure. So every blood vessel will have a lumen, the esophagus will have a lumen, the stomach will have a lumen, the bladder will have a lumen, and so a lumen is just the space in the center. It's usually filled with something. In this case, it would be filled with blood. The innermost vessel layer is the tunica intima. So the tunica intima, the innermost layer, will be a very thin layer of flat endothelial or epithelial cells and a relatively thin layer of subendothelial connective tissue. We'll take them to the histology lab and they'll be able to look at microscope slides of the tissues that are injured in musculoskeletal cases, so bone and cartilage and muscle and nerve tissue. We'll give them the basics, at least, of reading plain film and CT film and a little bit on um, MRI. So let's take uh, a brief quiz question. Like the shoulder joint, the hip joint permits motion in three axes. Therefore, the hip joint is an example of which of the following joints? Which? Bowling side. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think that's it for this one. So this is an example of the didactic part, so we encourage them to go through this and we give them lots of chances to, to see that they're actually getting it. But we're building up towards the experience that um, I think really has the most opportunity for a more global thing, which is that we can take people in remote corners of the world and bring them right into the Harvard Gross Anatomy Laboratory, which is a wonderful thing. Few institutions have a laboratory like this. So we can have the second one. <clears throat> we will take them into the Gross Anatomy Laboratory and show them actual dissections. Welcome back to the Gross Anatomy Lab. The axillary nerve will be coming into the muscle itself about five centimeters below. And so, we're cutting with the belly of the blade. We're gonna see how deep we are. Okay. We can even eat the muscle. You left the green something that we have adopted here as practice in teaching all the anatomy courses that we teach. And that is using clinical procedures and surgical approaches for all of our dissections. So we want our students to see anatomy as they will see it in practice. So this is the surgery <coughs> clip, and this is the anatomy <coughs> We think that dissection is the best way to understand the human body. We think that it's compelling. We think it's immediate. We think it includes active learning skills. <laughs> We think it is um, a marvelous thing to see. We think it is beautiful. We think it is logical. We wanted to share that with a wider audience, and so that's why we're inviting other students to come to the lab. I think that's enough. <laughs> Thank you, Trudy. Yeah. Time for a couple of questions. Are you all okay? <laughs> <laughs> no passing out.
I guess a general question to, to you both. To what extent were you inundated with emails after uh, running this? Did people continue to, to follow up? Were you receiving um, hundreds a day of inquiries? No, no. It, it's worth saying that one stalker. <laughs> As a general rule, the course has set the expectation that there won't be direct email. That doesn't stop some people, I imagine, from emailing you, but, but that's not offered as an option in these courses. This is kind of a related question, but what's the, what kind of interaction is built into the course between you and the students and between the students and each other? Um, Lots between students and each other. The best, you know, one of the problems is that this is not, these are not per credit. Um, credit is if you complete it, and nobody's going to tell you whether you did well. We had six or seven teaching fellows who responded to assignments with as many people as we had. People didn't get a lot of individual attention. What was surprising and wonderful was how much attention they got from each other. Lots of peer uh, evaluation. Um, it's just a humanities course. Mine was, so you can't, if there aren't any quantitative ways, and we really need to work harder on the interactive part of it because the HarborDex or edX platform is not really set up to make that easy. And we did have one group, one museum in Texas that organized discussion groups with their docents. And we're hoping to maybe try that model next time around is to get local discussion groups going and some museum people um, leading discussions. And something I learned from Rob before we actually started, who was the first person to hear about our fine dog, <laughs> was that for many people, and, and I think this was a lesson from Greek heroes, the most natural way to teach is the way you teach. And few of us teach in a green room in, in the library here. Um, talking to a student who's next to you and looking at a camera so we had to build that interaction in, but, but, but building it in, the best way to do it was naturally, the way that we actually teach. And so very little of it is lecture. And I think the part that works best is actually the inter interactive part in the Girls Anatomy mm -hmm. So please join me. Um, we'll, we'll hopefully have another time at the end I for just, further questions. Oh. I just wanted to say best of luck to you with your own flying dogs. <laughs> So, um, so what we'd love to do now is to have the groups come together and based on what you've heard of the experiences that Laurel and Trudy have, have had and are having as we speak, to think about the question and to share with each other and then, and then ultimately with the entire group, how could the development of digital content on HarvardX, the content itself, the process of re reconceptualizing the course or thinking about evaluative research questions you might have, or access to a global audience feed effectively into what's happening in the Harvard classroom. So let me just give you just one brief example from my own experience. So unfortunately, I haven't had the time to do my own HarvardX project yet. <laughs> I'm working on it. Sort of. Mm -hmm. But what I did learn from Harvard X was in terms of the pedagogy of interspersing sort of assessment with shorter modules of content. I, I deployed that in my freshman course on campus using Canvas and the modules function of Canvas as a way of engaging students that was much more interactive than simply assigning the book chapter. So I ripped the chapters from a, from a textbook, fortunately it's my own, so the public <laughs> be chopped everything up, interspersed in interactive assessments, and assigned that instead of the book. And in the same way that from Harvard X, we get a click stream of data on who's doing what, how long they're taking, something that should take them 15 minutes is taking them two hours. I got that same data 
from my life sciences class in Harvard College, which allowed me to stand up far better informed than I've ever did in my entire career in the, in the lecture hall. So just an example of how the process itself, or thinking about it, can change what happens in the classroom. So we're going to have um, poster sheets on each table and markers. And what we'd like you to do is, as a group, is there one of these three issues, three or four? Do you have comments on all of them? Brainstorm with us on some of your ideas for how you might leverage sort of the catalytic opportunity of Harvard X to transform what you're doing in your on-campus classes because that's something we are completely committed to making sure happens. So Valerie will be bringing around paper and markers. We're gonna ask you to write this all down in poster form. We'll put them up at the end and Rob and I will circulate if you have any questions. Also like to point out Annie Valva in the blue in the middle, our associate director who um, can be on hand to, to help as well. All right. All right. All right, so here's what we're going to do in our um, waiting time together as we get the posters um, in the back. So first of all, um, this is always the hard part, which is to pull you away from such wonderful conversation, and we've heard many themes and uh, many ideas and questions that we'll need to figure out how to follow up on. Um, as, as we transition out of the conference back into our daily lives. But first of all, thank, thank you for tackling this in such a compressed time frame. I want to point to just a couple of themes that um, we've heard as we've been circulating and then invite you um, as we close to kind of look at the specifics. Um, heard about the importance of feedback loops within the learning communities online and even, perhaps even more importantly between the online communities and on campus. And I wonder if uh, this group here, Jonathan, your group, could speak to that just very briefly. Um, oh, we're the one black there. And um, a lot of it had to do with uh, uh, just the fact that a lot of these classes have classroom equivalents and sometimes, you know, uh, uh, college equivalent, uh, extension school equivalent, and then the online equivalent. And in some, not all, but some cases, the content is pretty much comparable across. The, so the notion is there's some way to run you know, an online class and the classroom versions in parallel, so at least everybody could be sharing the discussion and conversation, especially since there's um, probably, you know, given how many people are, have advanced degrees in the edX course, it could be a real resource for, um, Younger students taking the course. Of course. Um, same thing in terms of, uh, oh, I think writing assignments that you can be using uh, the either um, writing assignments you use in your classroom to develop rubrics, to design assignments that could be used online, but even vice versa. You could take data you're gathering from peer graded essay assignments or things that are, are somewhat more complicated in the online version and use that to inform some of the um, assignments you give in the classroom. Great, I'm gonna, I'm gonna pause you there just to get a sense of the ideas there. Um, I wanna gesture to a general theme that we heard that took on multiple directions that I think gives us a lot to think about, about collaboration across uh, schools at Harvard, across teaching and learning and academic technology and teaching staff and faculty, how there could be more conversation um, ongoing. This is an example we hope of something we can do more. Um, heard from one group the idea of modularization, and those of us, uh, those of you who haven't talked to us much, don't know that this is one of our favorite words um, because it, it's connected to a concept that we think is very powerful. And Claudia, I wonder if I could get you to your group talked about modularization. Could you say a couple words about it? Oh, well, okay, so uh, modularization. So I'm, I'm part of a team that has helped to bring forth the Heroes Act project. Like it's a large team. Um, and so this is our third time offering it. Originally, uh, there were 24 learning units in it. Now we broke it up into five modules of varying length. Um, usually they have like this, you know, five, five units. It varies a little bit. Um, sort of five chapters within each module. And so it, it's just gonna give our participants greater flexibility in terms of uh, customizing their experience in the project, what access, uh, what content they really wanna access, what they wanna focus their learning around. 
Um, and I think it drives up participation, ideally, uh, and motivation to get to the end. It's a little bit easier. Rob, you want to <coughs> elaborate on that just a little bit for the, so everyone can hear more generally what Barbara is thinking about? Right. So, um, so something we're found is that, you know, you know, back to that, uh, that issue, for example, Laurel's experience was that 7% finished, quote unquote, the course. And normally that is a sort of run up the flagpole as a terrible disaster. Mm -hmm. When in fact, <laughs> when we survey learners that have registered and ask them, do you intend to finish? On the order of maybe 20% to 25% at the beginning, say they intend to do the entire course. Because what I think many individuals are looking for is something of particular interest in that topic area that they'd like to engage with. And of course, there are the limitations of time. So increasingly, we are thinking that, of course, we, we are still doing courses, but there's a level of modularization that will allow, for example, the learners, he or she can select the particular things that they'd like to do. And it, it also allows us programmatically to begin to think about clusters. So for example, one could imagine a cluster in global health that we bring together things in the life sciences and the social sciences, in culture, for example, in history, uh, across a large umbrella, where then you can thread sort of very particular learning experiences across this kind of topic. I should say that this idea is gaining significant traction in some departments on campus, and this notion of modularization to drive more personalized learning in conjunction with, in the case of Harvard students, deep advising and mentoring from faculty is something that is increasingly coming up in department stuff. Thank you. I want to pull up one other thing in terms of the process of how an online course will connect to campus. And I believe this table again and goes about how global viewpoints could have a positive impact on campus. Would one of you like to speak to that briefly? Oh, um, my field is history of science and the focus on early science, so it involves a lot of times and places. And one of the exercises that I thought would be very useful would be to generate time, place, zones through, you know, check data through a course and so on and try to feed it back into timelines that would really encourage um, views of encounters between scholars at different times and places, and um, the use of technology in a way that we couldn't do without it, not just for presentation, but really coming up with um, a way to think new about, about the encounters and so on. And these, these timelines would be very, very useful and easy to generate and bring it back into you know, developing the timelines and putting it back into the course. So that's one, one example of what I could use in my uh, feel to, to do that. And I know that if my other colleagues had other thoughts. Joe, if I could put you on the spot about your time zone back to campus. Yeah, I was just making a simple point that, you know, a lot of undergrads uh, like to work in the middle of the night, all, all, all hours, day and, and night, and have, having, you know, because of the time zone differences, people all, as well as the number of people in a course, people all over the world can be helping and discussing all the material. That's a perfect segue for the last thing I'm going to pull out for this group, I believe. This group over here talked about learning, developing learning communities. Um, Terry, could you speak to that? Um, yeah, actually we were thinking that uh, a lot of the, um, sort of obviously a lot of the learning communities that are out there online can be imported into the uh, um, brick and mortar classroom and that uh, we talked a lot about peer assessment and how that might be a device for, for both generating community and um, uh, creating a kind of a mentality of understanding around the subject matter that uh, uh, would uh, both do the work of assessment and uh, build community in the course. Okay, thank you. So if I could take that as sort of the anchor for closing remark. Rob and I and the whole Harvard X team are very grateful that you're here to talk with us today and more importantly to talk with each other about the kinds of ideas you have and you'd like to pursue, whether it's with Harvard X formally or whether it's what you're already doing through the efforts um, that you've had in your, your classroom and your, your departmental settings. So what we'd like to do afterwards is reach out to you and figure out how we can leverage this time together into more of an intentional learning community and how we can stay in touch. That's something we struggle with and something that is really one of the most important and essential things that we could do. So 
with that, I'd like to thank you. Uh, particularly, like to thank our faculty again, Laurel Ulrich and Trudy Benson, and we hope to be talking with you soon. <laughs>